It's a great pleasure today to welcome one of my most uh, treasured colleagues at Fuller Theological Seminary, Dr. Todd Bolsinger. Todd, welcome. Thank you for joining us in this conversation today. Thank you, Mark. It really is good to talk with you about this. You know, I, I love the reflection that you've done, not just at Fuller, but also the, the work that you've done as you've been a consultant and a speaker in so many different settings in churches and ministries around the country and in different parts of the world. The book that you've just recently authored is about to come out this fall is a, a really great follow on to the last book that you did. It's entitled Tempered Resilience, How Leaders Are Formed in the Crucible of Change. Tempered Resilience, How Leaders Are Formed in the Crucible of Change. That title alone, Tempered Resilience, uh, begs an image, which is at the very core of the whole book. And it, it is the thing that as an image and as an idea and as an actual fact shapes everything that you're trying to offer up. So let's just start right there. Tell us what Tempered Resilience actually even means. Yeah. Where it comes so, from. so it's a it's a blacksmithing metaphor, which and I always think of blacksmithing when <laughs> exactly, I think of it. Really. Exactly. Well, which is it's ironically it, it, com it comes about horseshoes. Yeah, yeah it, <laughs> it comes out of a an urban blacksmithing community in Los Angeles. There hasn't been a horse there in a hundred years, but there is a group <laughs> of people who do blacksmithing. And um, my wife, as you know, is an artist, and we took this class in blacksmithing. And what was interesting about it was as a um it's it's an art form that is almost violent in the way that it brings transformation, but it takes raw material and it turns them into tools that are both useful and beautiful. And it felt to me like this icon of what God has to do in the life of a leader to bring transformation. Well, it is an amazing image, just like the last book of Canoeing the Mountains was an amazing, captivating image. This is another captivating image. Tell us a little bit more about when you were taking this class, you describe it a bit in the opening part of the book about how certain aspects of this began to become really clear to you in a way that really is quite seminal to really, in a way, the subtitle, as you describe it, how leaders are formed in the crucible of change. How are leaders through this lens of this metaphor shaped? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so I started uh, years and years ago. My wife and I were in Prague, Czech Republic, and we saw these blacksmiths, these artisan blacksmiths. And I, and I, and I ended up getting a cross from them that I keep on my desk where I write. And I thought about watching that work of how you transform the steel into something that can be useful. And so we took this blacksmithing class just out of a curiosity. And what we realized is when you go into a blacksmithing class, literally before you know it, you are blacksmithing. Like, 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 like they, like all they gave us was like ear protection. No, it's I, not I, I, about I, the idea of blacksmithing. Yeah, exactly. Really. <laughs> right. It's not like something you do on YouTube. It's like, there's no, there was no, it was weird. There was no, I thought there'd be gloves and aprons and, and, you know, chain mail to protect you. And you're very <laughs> exposed. You give you ear protection. They hand you this pair of tongs and a steel. You throw the steel rod into the forge and you're blacksmithing. And then they start the safety lecture. And I thought, this is the experience that most leaders have. They, they come into this thing, they get thrown into the fire, and the next thing they know, they are being shaped by the work. And right. then one of the very first parts about the, the whole idea of the formation of leaders is that leaders are formed in the leading. And that's one of the reasons why it feels so vulnerable and it's so difficult. Right. And it's out of that vulnerability that some of the most important lessons about resilience and tempered steel and why both things are essential. Just give us a, a overview of that so we understand where yeah. we're going. And then I want to get into some of the details of the book. Yeah. So, so the very first part you realize is that if you're going to shape steel into a tool, it first has to be broken down. Right. So it has to it has to become molten. I mean, literally, like it, it's it's almost oozy. And once you've taken a piece of steel and you put it into a furnace, um, a few minutes in, the instructor told us to pull it out and look at it. And he goes, don't touch it. It's 700 degrees. It'll burn the skin off your hands. But you can't do anything with it. If you pound on it now, you will mar it and scar it. Instead, you need to keep it back in the fire until it's almost 2000 degrees, until it literally becomes red and molten and oozy. And I thought to myself, the experience of most leaders I know is they're always defending themselves from the vulnerability of leadership. Right. They're, they're, they want to stay at 700 degrees. They look the right. same. They've just been through some heat. Yes. But, they, 
But what it actually requires for us to become the kinds of leaders who can actually lead the kinds of deep organizational change we're talking about today that's happening in churches and organizations, schools, is there's a kind of vulnerability that feels like you're being broken down when the truth is you're actually being, it's the beginning of the shaping and forming of the kind of resilience that can actually enable you to become that kind of tool that can bring change. Well, what is so striking to me when I was reading the book again was that it has this sense that this, the staying in the fire is so difficult because it's at times being in the fire is exactly what we literally should not be. Um, mm -hmm. And then there's other times when it is exactly what we must be. Mm -hmm. And so there's partly a discernment around that. In the image of steel, for the sake of the purposes that you're describing, it, you have to stay in the fire. But yeah. when you're in circumstances that in normal life feel like you're just actually getting burned up, not just yeah. heated up, then yeah. it feels like it's the difference between survival and death. So yeah. how would you, how do you discern when you mm -hmm. stay in the fire and when you don't stay in the fire? Yeah. So, so, so one of the, I mean, almost every leadership book that talks about leadership character formation talks about the fact that leaders are formed in that crisis, in those crises moments. So we're not talking in this say about dysfunction or we're not talking about uh, being in a bad situation or an exploitive situation. We're talking about the actual work of leadership that is just hard. You know, it's the Harry Truman. If you can't stand the heat, stay out of the kitchen. Right. What I discovered, however, is that for most leaders to actually be transformed so you can accomplish what you want to accomplish, you actually need it to be much hotter than just the kitchen. And that heat is the heat of self-reflection. And that the skill set that leaders have to discover in those moments that are really hard is, can you allow yourself to go into the place of, of deep self-reflection about your strengths, your weaknesses, the areas where you feel vulnerable, the areas where you need help? If you don't have the capacity to self-reflect, you'll never have the capacity to be formed. And that's, so what we're talking about here is the good work, the good necessary work that comes in every leadership situation, which is really different. I mean, obviously, we've got to make sure that people aren't in destructive, um, toxic environments. Here, we're talking about just that work that the very best leaders have to go through if they're going to be able to bring the kinds of change they're called to bring. So it's really about the heat that the learner leader Mm -hmm. has to actualize for themselves or as it were inflict on themselves in order yes. to be able to do this work as opposed yeah. to the heat going up because of the screaming people at the door or whatever. Exactly. Like. Exactly. Yeah. 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 It's the, it's the vulner. It's weird. The great irony is that it, to develop the strength of, to be able to lead change, you actually have to embrace vulnerability. And this is one of the, this is the part that most of us in leadership just hate because the moment before you become a leader, you actually were probably a really competent expert at something, right? You were like, you were the head salesperson. So you became the sales manager or you were the best speaker. So you became, went from being a speaker to the senior pastor. You were, you know, you had the biggest Vita. The, um, and so you, then you became the dean of the school. Like the hard part is you went from being the expert to the vulnerable leader who is being shaped in this moment. And that's one of the most difficult parts of the leadership process. So in that leadership uh, vulnerability, you have to bring to the table all that you are, but also all that you genuinely aren't and that mm -hmm. you have to be formed in order to become. And that your argument is that that can only actually happen as you submit to the process of this formation, right? Isn't yeah. that the, yeah. the character yeah. of it? So tell us about going back to the image of the forge, go back and tell us what happens in the vulnerability in that case and how resiliency is built and how that, mm -hmm. how those things interact, because it's a lot of the argument of the book turns on how those things actually connect. Yeah. Yeah. So, so um, one of the places that, that is really evident is when you study the work of leaders who've been able to bring significant change, I mean, genuine change, there are moments of deep doubt and deep despair. That this goes right along with it. These aren't people with perfectly fig, um, planned, executed strategies. And that one of the things about that is your capacity to be able to go through those moments and learn as you go. So the vulnerability of leadership is really built around the humility of learning. And that requires a kind of strength and it develops a kind of strength. So the forge itself isn't just the heat of leadership. It's the heat of self-reflection. Right. And that's really the most, 
difficult part. If you don't have the capacity to self-reflect, you'll never be a transformational leader, as far as I can tell. Um, and you make it more about self-reflection as opposed to simply reflection, meaning yeah. uh, externally oriented reflection. It's really about internal. Yeah. Why is that the case as opposed to external? Well, because in self-reflection is ultimately where you have to come to grips with um, what you're made of. I mean, you're, you're, you're right. once it's your own raw material. And that for many of us, again, who who are stepped into leadership, what we were good at, the very thing that got us there is the thing that often gets in our way. Right. So, so I often say that, you know, the, I have been a good talker since I was four, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> like, you know, like, like, God like bless your parents. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Like, <laughs> right. You know, I could, I do okay in school, except for speaks only in turn. <laughs> and, um, and, um, and, but by the time I got into leadership, I realized that I needed to develop the capacity to listen and that was hard for me. Just it still continues to be hard. It is the ongoing spiritual practice of my life to be a better listener, and that my leadership is developed developed more upon the humility of listening and learning than it is on my being uh, articulate and impassioned and mm -hmm. uh, get three points in a poem out or something. <laughs> right, right.